from Los Angeles, California. Welcome to CG Society. I'm your host, Travis Borbeau, and today we're joined by my guest, Finn McManus, concept artist and designer. And boy, are you in big trouble. Um, <laughs> we talked to Leah from Blizzard earlier this week, who cast you in the villainous role what? Of, of, doubling, <laughs> of doubling the workload and causing sleep deprivation. Uh. The rest yes, that is life. true. That is true. <laughs> and it was great, though. Oh, man, that was such a fun week. It, it was definitely a hardcore week. But I mean, she's right that if she wants to cast me in that way, I mean, <laughs> I, I'll be the villain. So for the rest of the rest of you, if you missed Leah earlier this week, what she was talking about, and, and it's a good point to start on today, I think, um, was the fact that surprisingly, even after being at Riot and Blizzard, she typecast herself as one of the students that was in the middle, that there's always the students that are a little bit behind the students that are way ahead. And, you know, I, I think personally with about 15 years in education, the majority of both students and artists in the industry would probably cast themselves as, as being in the middle, somebody that has to work very hard to be good at what they do and, and kind of keep up their self-education. And she noted that, you know, there's a quote at Art Center, which says that, you know, if you want to be good, if you want to be successful, double the homework. And so she went through the story of um, the instructor, John, um, assigning 30 paintings in a week, which is enough to cause anybody yeah. sleep deprivation, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and pick up what, where, what you did in that situation. Oh, I mean, I, at that point, honestly, I was, I wouldn't say I was like extremely cocky, but I just, I wanted to impress John because uh, I hadn't known him like now he and I are really good friends. You know, I've taught with him. I've right. taught for him. But uh, back then, you know, this was only our, our second class with him. And I and this guy was like one of my favorite artists. So I really wanted to do a good job. So I was like, you know, screw 30 paintings. I'm going to do 50 paintings in a week. And this <laughs> is in addition to all our other classes, in addition to, you know, we had like five classes at the time. And, you know, I didn't really think before I said, I was like, it's just going to happen. And it did, you know, we did it and it was, it was painful. <laughs> and that was, you know, that was the start of, you know, this, the three or four week process of doing that many each week. And it just like killed us. Uh, but I would definitely say it in terms of my entire timeline of learning, uh, that was the, the best week for me. Uh, we, we learned so much doing that process and just, I mean, really, I sat at my computer every day. I timed every painting for 50 minutes to an hour, some were shorter, some were 30 minutes, um, and tried to plan out how I could eat really quickly, how I could, like, what amount of sleep I could get by on without, you know, losing my design sense. Um, and yeah, it was, it was an incredible week. I'll always remember that. <laughs> what do you, what do you feel like you gained out of that individual experience alone? Um, um, as as I, I didn't think I could do it at first. So I, I feel I'm a big fan of, um, setting setting a goal for yourself that you that you doubt that you can achieve uh because and also having a, a responsibility attached to it so for instance if if i was just setting this goal by myself and i just told myself outside of school i'm going to do this amount of work there's nothing really holding me and attaching me to that but if you assign a goal where there's responsibility attached for instance being in a class or disappointing someone you really respect Right. Um, that attaches so much more pressure to it that it really pushes you over the edge. And during that week after doing that, uh, man, I mean, I learned a ton. It was time management. It was life management. Um, I learned a ton of different techniques. You know, another thing I'm a big fan of is working under pressure causes you and forces you to, to make creative solutions, uh, solutions that you right. normally wouldn't think of. Um, and so I, I encourage everybody to... Uh, try to try to set deadlines and pressure for yourself to to make your body work in overtime. It's kind of like that adrenaline rush that you get, but in terms right. of uh, it, it forces you to really think outside of the box. And and during that week, I learned a lot of techniques just because I was panicking to finish stuff on time. Um, and yeah, it was just everything from composition, design, color, narrative. Uh, it's it really pushed me to try to think in, in a way I hadn't thought of as a student before. There's a Mike Tyson quote says everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. And, and in this industry, one of the comments that I, I make a lot when students ask, like as far as skill or, you know, where the focus is, 
I said one skill that doesn't get talked about in school as much, which you kind of just hit on exactly, is either, you know, kind of taking that punch in the gut or the punch in the face, like in, in all areas of life, you know, buying a car you can't afford. It sounds like irresponsible things um, when you throw it out there, taking on too much freelance work, um, you know, putting yourself in that situation where you're not prepared for it and you've got to either survive or die, right? Yeah, um, and you got to find your limit at some point, right? Like you have to know how far you can push yourself. And I feel like, you know, failure is going to be inevitable in that situation if you really try to find your limit, but you could really end up surprising yourself. Um, like I didn't think that, and I'm sure it was the same for Leah at the time, that we didn't think we were capable of, of doing that much, of learning that much, of going that far. But in the end, it, it we were, and it, it worked out great. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, and I, I'd recommend that again to everybody to try to, to try to, uh, find out what your limit is as a human being, like try to push yourself past what you think is possible. Well, on the topic of importance, whether that be impressing your teacher, I, I think that that works in the first three weeks out of a 10 week semester, right? Or <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, you know, it's, it's something that John was almost like a God to us at that time. It's someone that right. not, not just that we looked up to, but that we wanted to be like, we could, we wanted to see ourselves in his shoes five, 10 years from that point. Um, so it was, it was like, he was like more of a mentor to us. Like we didn't want, it wasn't just a normal, you know, this is just my teacher for a year and we'll move on. But uh, someone that we've both looked up to for a very long time. Uh, so it, it was more, I would say it, it had more pressure involved than just a class, but I, I see what you mean. It's like that works for a time, but it might not always be the case, right? Yeah, I go to students all the time. I mean, you know, we had a class of Dylan Cole. He's a production designer avatar, you know, your old boss at this point. Right? <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and I'll have students that for some reason will miss a class, um, won't, you know, spend the time on homework and, and I'll go to them. And I'll be like, hey, man, I, I know it's week eight, but, uh, you know, your your teacher, that's Dylan. <laughs> right. Mm, you know, yeah. and, and but I've watched that universally, no matter how much somebody is a fan of a teacher, you know, life gets busy and has distractions. And it's really where you see the students that are hungry for it, not. And one of the things that, you know, both Leah and, and you kind of mentioned as well, is when it comes to doing the work, there has to be a level of importance that has the endurance to get you through. So, you know, whether that's being in the middle and, and having somebody above you that pushes you and is there in a classroom with you to stay up at three o'clock in the morning to get work yeah. done. I feel like it's those students, the students that categorize themselves in the middle that, either survive or die inside and outside of a class. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a class. It could be a group of friends that are artists that have the same motivations that you have and, and more discipline that, mm -hmm. that keep you working. Um, and I feel like that's where, you know, the students that don't get that, that are in the middle, sometimes end up not being able to get into this industry because they just didn't have that extra oomph to give them the endurance to get through the, the kind of speed bump, so to speak. Um, yeah, for sure. And that's just observation from the outside. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, one of the ways that I found out through about your art was I found your art online through Facebook, just kind of popping up a few times. And then you ended up taking a class with Ken Faircloud. And at the same time, you were teaching at Brainstorm. And we had a conversation about your previous work. And, you know, here you are. I don't know how old you are, but I'm going to guess that you're, you know, pretty young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you've already been to ILM. You've already done, you know, concept design with some of the top teams and top artists out there. You were over Lightstorm just previously and you're on your way to Disney. And when I look at that, I see an artist who's hungry, not just to get their foot in the door, but who's hungry and passionate about picking up and, and learning. And yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of different facets to that. Um, I would say the biggest one that I've learned uh, actually, just when I was starting out, right when I got to Art Center and Brainstorm, was that I actually the the part that I enjoy most about this entire field is the act of learning, is the act of picking up something that's a challenge that really tests your ability and mastering it, or at least learning it and coming to terms with it. And uh, I've noticed that at times when I've uh, completely learned something and it's no longer a challenge, it's no longer fun for me because of that, and it's not it's not something that I'm as into anymore. And I have to find something else, some other challenge, some other problem to solve. Um, the other facets to that are that it's just more of a professional aspect is that our industry is always growing and changing. I mean, anybody here has probably probably understands how, how fast technology is evolving, how fast the industry itself is evolving. If you look at pieces, uh, the top artists were doing 10, 15 years ago, 
and compare those to the pieces uh, just like students are producing now, you can see that there's always a skill level that's rising throughout every uh, discipline. So everybody's always learning and growing and it's not something that stops at a certain point. It's not like someone hits a plateau and then that's just it. Uh, but you have to always uh, learn and adapt with the industry. Yes, like Kalina says, some pieces are timeless, definitely. But I think if you look at overall the quality of work that's produced 10, 15 years ago and look at today, you'll see that there's a big quality difference in terms of overall the techniques people are using, the amount they learn about composition, about a design sense. Um, and a lot of works can look amateur if you compare them to what people are producing today. And well, the bar I, Go ahead. Yeah, continue. Oh, I was just saying that, you know, that was just one of the things, but um, in order to keep up with everybody else, I feel like you need to find like artists need to find some way to enjoy the learning process for me that came naturally i was just happy with it i always want to be challenged so i'm going to seek those things out but um i would say that you know learning more is a necessity for what we do uh the world is changing the technology is changing and we we have to adapt or people are going to be left behind i've definitely seen that happen too and i've, I've been in the industry long enough now that i can confidently say that you know, they're the things that 10 years ago gave you the advantage that are now the requirement. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, you know, cool. that that could be a, uh, you know, branding of, of your art and who you are and what you provide it and making sure that you have a strong public knowledge of that. That could be, you know, the learning. I, I feel like 10 years ago and to some extent still, but 10 years ago, it felt much more like it was the advanced freelance artist that was introducing new software. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that be Vitaly jumping on KeyShot four years before anybody's paying attention to it, um, you know, whoever that may be, whatever software it is that they have the time to try. And a lot of times that's provided by students. And I think, I think the thing that hasn't changed throughout the industry beyond my experience, even before, was that the student always has been nipping at the heel of the pro. It's always what yeah. keeps the pro sharp. It's always what keeps the pro pushing and, and, and growing as an element of, of why they do things. Um, but now now I feel like it's not necessarily the, the rock star kick-ass freelance artist that's introducing new software. Now I feel like the standard is, is that the next generation's coming up. There's solid education for them, not just in one or two spots, but across the board. You don't have to spend $20,000 a term to compete with somebody who's the top. And it's only going to take you three years, not seven, to catch them. And yeah, so I think if you're a pro now and you're not constantly at least, you know, you don't have to be kind of stressing out and, you know, staying up till five o'clock in the morning working out, but you have to have an awareness. You should at least be trying out one of those new software packages. You should at least be taking a look at what a renderer does. You should be at least taking a look at what you, how your pipeline might change if you introduce 3D. If you're not, man, it, you better just really have one hell of a reputation, a resume and credits to your yeah. list because it's But tough. not only that, but also to experiment with completely new things. And this is something I recommend to everybody as well is that you never know when that, that new technology, that new program, that new medium will change how you design. And that recently happened to me with VR. No one had exactly like recommended me to pick up Oculus Medium, but it was just there and I tried it out and it just was amazing to me. And uh, nowadays, you'll see a ton of people using, you'll see people using Gravity Sketch, you'll see people using all these different programs like Quill, and it just, it it's, we're on the brink of um, a huge change in how I think artists will design in the future. And it's something, it's it's a new art form. It's not like it it is something that just fits into the concept art pipeline for everybody. It's actually something that is developing and evolving on its own in separation from concept art, but it can be used for it as well. And I think it's it's a really unique time to be able to pick up all these new technologies, these new ideas, and try them out because it could be a student that tries this out and recommends it to other people. There are there are actually things that I've learned from my students all the time that I actually did not know. And I think it's it's just we live in a time where now the technology is so accessible to everybody that you could anybody could find out what the next big thing is in the industry. Uh, 
I feel like every conversation you have these days, you need to have the notebook open. You know, like yeah, we've got yeah. we got to the point where we understand, you know, have a sketchbook. But I constantly tell my students have two sketchbooks. One is for everyone else to look at. Anyone can critique. You have to be willing to show anybody at any time anything in it without saying a word. And one that's completely for you. And the one that's yeah. completely for you, it's not about just drawing or sketches or being amazing at art, but it's about taking notes, whether that's the way that light is playing off of the rock surface or whether that's something somebody said or a book they recommended it's just a catalog to go back to because there are so many things fighting for your attention these days yeah. and i think it's good to stick on vr just for a moment even though you know we we haven't haven't talked about vr too much but with you know with htc vive i'm a bit disappointed because really the only thing that's kept it from being a paperweight for me is um google earth uh, mm -hmm. you know, being able to travel to locations I've either been or want to go, mapping out, planning out where to photograph. Uh, I think it's a brilliant tool for that, but also makes you pretty nauseous jumping around the planet. <laughs> yeah. um, but as far as sketching tools and as far as, you know, 3D tools, you know, I was able to go into the one paint app they have. And I, I got to be honest, had a blast modeling in there, but didn't see it getting to the level or the resolution or the convenience that was possible. And I'm kind of curious why nobody was forward thinking on being the next Adobe for VR early mm -hmm. on that, that we're still pretty far out on somebody on the HTC side um, that I've experienced doing anything great. What do you think is the realism of VR being an actual tool within a pipeline that meets the time demands that the studio requires and the resolution and, and, and just the workspace period that yeah, makes I mean, it realistic? Yeah. I'm not sure if we talked about this earlier, but it's uh, it's literally, it's already there. Like I've already been on productions where the entire art department is using it uh, for and everything. That, right. Um, so it's already, I think it's already at that stage. And, um, you know, like we were talking about the the students, the, the, the rest of the industry usually follows what the professionals are doing and what what's actually modern techniques used in professional studios. Um, and, and especially freelancers, because they don't have to go through the the uh, the issues of getting something approved through managers and all this corporate stuff. So it's already there. I'm using it on every single project. I used it earlier today. Um, and I know tons of colleagues who use it. A lot of them don't like literally publicize it. A lot of them don't mention it. So, on. Some of them are like, I'm going to keep this in my pocket till I've got a master. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that too. yeah, yeah. But, you know, I was, I was just having a discussion with a, with a good friend of mine last night about how we can use it as a as a tool to tell stories, as a tool for production. Um, and I really I'm a huge believer in it because I know I know a lot of the people that are developing it. I've been to Oculus's headquarters. I know what they're planning. And it's something that is absolutely going to change how we how we design. And it already is for me. I'm already I'm already converted. I I'm pretty sure every time I do a workshop from now on, it's going to be in VR just because I think that is way more relevant. It's faster. You can get design done much, much quicker in it. And um, yeah, I, I just think anybody who hasn't tried it out, really give it a shot because every single person that I've showed it to that has actually gone inside and built something has uh, been convinced, honestly. And it's funny because at first there's a lot of doubters like I'll, I'll have some friends of mine who will be like, ah, no, that's there's no way it's going to replace this or this. And, and they're right. It's not going to replace anything. It's right. it's a new tool and it's new. It's a new medium. It's a new uh, art style. It's a new it's a new way of thinking. And yeah. uh, it's just something that everybody needs to try out uh, to really understand if it's for them. And I feel like it's going to work for many, many people in the industry. And I think sometimes that's what makes people hesitant. You know, I, there's been at least three years now where. You know, my my view is that if you're a concept artist, learn 3D. And and a lot of times your words can get twisted or or your um, your direction, you know, in saying that can be mistaken, which is it doesn't mean that you're going to convert to 3D, that you're going to stop doing 2D. Yes. It just means that as a tool set, you know, don't be the guy that doesn't have the ability to put something into a turntable or, or to you know, be able to put basic geometry into the paint over if somebody asks for that or needs that in production. You know, the worst thing that I see happens to students today is when you get into the industry and you're you're doing really, really great and somebody comes to you with this expectation because that is the expectation now and you don't have that skill. Um, it's rough. And, and I'm wondering how long, you know, with the conversation with you on VR, you know, what do you think that trickle down time 
to the student is because you know it goes both ways there's a trickle up time where the student picks it up and i really like what you said about freelance which is you know part of the reason that freelance was able to have such impact on using new software is they don't have the limitations of being told no um, mm -hmm. whatever it takes to get the job done which is the mentality of this industry for the most part um whatever it takes yeah, to so job I, done, do it <clears throat> yeah i think that uh, a major thing is the price um i know when i was a student you know i was eating like cup ramen and just trying to get by doing my homework and everything. Uh, it needs to be accessible for a lot of people. I mean, personally for me, if I if I look at the price, it's $300, $400 for a set. That is 100% worth it. But I think it's, people don't realize that it's worth it until they really get to know the tools. Um, right. I 100% I think that it's worth the $400 you could spend, but I can see it getting down to 200. You know, once a new Oculus comes out, uh, it'll be, I think it'll be way easier to convince people because probably the main set will go down to 200 or something. It'll go down farther. And that's when people can start buying it up uh, more as enthusiasts and then realizing that it's actually worth it. Um, so I think it's probably another, I would give it, I mean, I, I would probably give it like three years. I mean, you're already seeing, um, I, I kind of compare it to how 3D code kind of broke out and people started using that everywhere. You know, Jama was one of the first people to really turn artists onto 3D code. And after he started releasing all these tutorials, that's when more and more people got into it. Studios started getting into it. Um, I think it's going to be a similar thing. I think people will see how how many people, how many professionals are demoing with it, are using it for daily, uh, you know, sketches and paintings, and then it'll just spread. I think it's not something that is going to take too long. I, I would say within five years for sure. And uh, I just want to ask a answer a couple things people are, are saying right now in the chat sure. is that it, sure. it will never replace traditional media. You know, it'll never replace foundations. And that's something that actually Goro pointed out in my talk in Mexico that I needed to mention uh, was that you have to I, I really think you have to have a good foundation before you jump into these tools because you cannot learn design and drawing and perspective from jumping straight into a lot of these things. It's something that you need to practice beforehand and always be very, very important. Um, right. So speed speed I, really comes from those foundations that you make. Yes, you don't have the foundations. Speed, you're in, in trouble. speed in the sense of design, the eye for good design, that all comes from the foundational skills and the practice that you put in beforehand. It'll never replace painting. It'll never replace, you know, the traditional tools. Uh, it'll just be another thing that's added on at the end. That's more of uh, another thing you can use in your arsenal. Um, also, another thing, um, someone's asking, how long can you use it? Uh, this is another thing. I think you can kind of build up tolerance. The first time I used it, I could only use it for 10 or 15 minutes before getting kind of queasy. But I feel like after you use it for maybe 30 minutes to an hour, um, after you use it for a couple of days, you, you can use it for then 30 minutes or an hour without getting a headache or without getting an issue with it and it's now there's a tolerance like, yeah exactly it's just i think it's like a tolerance you build up your your mind just kind of gets used to how it works um so i think it's totally it totally uh works out after a while uh you just have to give it a chance so the next question is not to jump away from vr but you know when we're talking about things that that keep the pros on their toes and and you know keeps people growing and and i, I want to mention too this is it's not always about the industry and being competitive. Sometimes it's just about being an artist and, and being able to visualize what you want, right? Like a lot of times yeah. in these conversations, we talk about it strictly from the business point of view. So one of the things I want to talk about though, like, as I said, is, you know, we're talking about a lot of new tools. We're talking about the things that keep people on their toes. You know, not everybody learns it because they're afraid of the guy coming up, but most of them just want to be a part. Like, you know, I yeah. want to be able to sketch in VR. I think it'd be cool. It doesn't have to be become an industry pipeline to what I use, it's just having that experience. I mean, for me, going in the scale, um, even if you just create a, a hall of armor with characters that are between three foot and six foot, the one experience you don't get in modeling in you know, ZBrush is you don't really get that sense of scale. And that's what's amazing to me is as soon as you step into VR, just approaching something where you're sculpting a face that's you know four feet across as opposed to yeah. just zoomed in and ZBrush, it's a completely different experience. It's a completely different feeling. And, and it forces you also to kind of back away from it, um, to zoom yeah. out. And and it's bizarre to say that zooming in and zooming out on ZBrush or, or Autodesk or whatever application you're on feels completely different. I mean, I'm the type of nerd that stands up from my desk and walks back from my, my monitor anyways, yeah. as opposed to zooming out, but it puts your head in a different place. Yeah, what are some... 
Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Continue. Could ask your question. Sorry about that. I didn't mean no, to no, because I was going to switch gears. So go ahead and just stay on that. And then well, I'll come, I just come back to quick add, add something to that is that that's another great thing about it is that uh, if you're working in film or games, a lot of times uh, when you're designing something, you're not seeing it from the way the player will see it. Um, and that's something that changes with VR because you could literally walk around a room as you design it and feel what it would be like from the player's perspective. Or right. say you're designing a film set, you could feel what the film set will look like from the camera's perspective. Uh, and that is a way to design that I think is, is very unique because you, you usually don't have that experience. You can, you can go in on your monitor in 3D and take a look at it, but you don't really have that ability to look around your scene, to like look left and right as if a player you know, in God of War or Call of Duty would. Uh, you don't have that ability, and that's something that's very unique as well. Yeah, I mean, I love if you get in and, you know, if I'm working on a character on the little experience I've had, there's times where I'll literally just lay down on the floor and look up at the character just just to get that point of view. Or yeah. the the opposite. One of the things I think I had more fun than even characters with was designing a bridge and then scaling that bridge to the point where I'm standing in the middle of it at human scale. And yeah. that is something that just, man, the effect that it has on your mind and your creativity is something that you're never going to get from Photoshop or ZBrush. Um, yeah, <laughs> like it absolutely. puts you into your mindset. So switching gears, you've kind of hopped around studios, and, and that's not because you're losing your job. You're, you're taking advantage of projects you want to be on, and mm -hmm. I think that that's that's great. Um, I think it keeps you in that learning mode. It keep I think it keeps you from stagnating. One of the reasons why we started doing these is because a lot of information does come from people that have only been to one or two studios, whether that's for a few years or even 10. And that's not to be derogatory saying that their information isn't excellent. It is. You know, everybody's info from their perspective is great. But I think that when you have moved around studios or even moved around from production pipelines, whether it be cinematic to film to commercial to TV, there are differences that, that give you um, just a knowledge that you wouldn't have had if you didn't do it. What are some of the things that you find are still being chased by students, still being chased by junior artists that are techniques that not are, are not necessarily obsolete, but that are not as advantageous to giving them an, an, an advantage getting in the door or being successful. Um, you and I talked about yeah. like, the value oh, of skillful man. huntsmen. I could, I, think. I could talk about this for ages because, <laughs> you know, I do a lot of portfolio reviews and I think that right. there is a huge difference as to what uh, some students are putting in their portfolio as, than what studios look for. And a thing that, that is annoying and frustrating for me to see is that a lot of teachers uh, who maybe haven't been in the industry in a while, like maybe they retired five to 10 years ago, uh, are not up to date in what they are telling their students to do. So then these students learn all these techniques and things that they, they think will help them out when in the end it's actually detracting. The first thing that is at the absolute worst uh, to me to see in a, in a junior portfolio, like your first job is fan art. You should not have any fan art and that's something that Goro and I were seeing a lot uh, of this last weekend uh, that we tried to tell people not to do because um, most studios will not like seeing fan art in your work, even if it's of their game. The reason right. for that is that you're borrowing from their IP. They actually own the content you're making if you're making fan art of their IP. They could tell you to take it down. They could technically sue you. Uh, it's it's actually pretty dangerous. And not only that, you're not really showing your own sense of design because you will be um, you're, you're borrowing all this information. You're you're already uh, have solved half of the problem, but it's not your work. It's someone else's. Uh, so that's the main thing about fan art that I, I have a big gripe with and that I've seen a lot of my colleagues gripe with when they, they get a bunch of portfolios. So no, I this recommend is Mm. Not, to, not to jump in or cut you no, off, but this is this is an excellent talking point because, as you know, I always want people that come on to disagree or have their opinion or have their experience to make sure, no matter what I say, they hit me over the head with it, right? Not to prove mm -hmm. me wrong, but to show the flip side of it. And this is one of the good things because five years ago, that was my absolute mentality, and I still agree with everything you're saying, meaning that there's so many things that get said in this industry that are correct, right? Um, yes. That are very, very good advice, but students, when they hear it, have to understand to apply it to the artist that it's coming from and the experience is coming from. Because for myself, five years ago, 
get fan art out, don't do fan art, don't waste time. Yeah. The thing that's changed over the past five years is Ironhead Studios, Legacy Effects, General Giant, Sideshow Collectibles, right? Like mm -hmm. now there's this whole market of uh, industry that pays a lot of attention to being able to do high level fan art. All right. And yep. so the thing is, don't put that fan art, you know, don't put Wolverine necessarily in if you're you're applying for a, a comic film. Right. But, you know, if you're a modeler and you, you're not sure where you're going, whether it's games, films, cinematics, the first thing you want to do, obviously, for a portfolio is figure that out to give yourself the best opportunity. But I think when people here don't do fan art, a lot of the information when it gets passed down, as I know, because I, I watch. I literally watch people do YouTube videos after they've done a class with me or, or watch something with me, take my information, put my information out in a different way. And I listen to it and I'm like, shit, that's coming straight from what I just said like two days ago. But now it's being delivered in a way to the wrong audience that's absolutely incorrect. Right. And so, like, yeah. I feel this responsibility to go back and say, well, well, hold on, hold on. That information is correct if you're applying it to Studio I, X. I just want to elaborate because some people are asking yeah. questions right now. Um, yeah. It's it's not that I don't think you can't learn from it. Uh, it's that uh, studios as a concept artist, from a concept art perspective, and you're from someone who knows managers, TV. art directors that have tried to hire concept artists, they half of the reason they hire you is for your ideas. Uh, for you to show that you're a good designer and that you can work with everything. A good concept artist will be able to, uh, you know, be put on five different films and be able to adapt to each style if they have different IPs, different styles. Uh, and yes, yes. So it's good that you can switch styles, but that's being able to switch styles, being able to do fan art, that is more of an illustration technique. It's not something of, that's more associated with design. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in that you can show you're a good designer. And if you do show that, then you'll be able to adapt to anything. They will automatically assume that you can adapt. Um, right. I'll say that most of the people on the Star Wars team when I was there did not have Star Wars fan art in their portfolio. They, most of them had never even touched a Star Wars IP or had, you know, drawn, or they haven't like had any of their main pieces be Star Wars fan art. And the reason is that they have so many other pieces of good design in their portfolio. They did not need to prove that they they could handle the Star Wars IP. It's just that they were already such good designers, such good thinkers that they can adapt to anything. They, you could put them on Transformers, on Ninja Turtles. You could put them on a cartoon, but they would be able to adapt to every single outcome. And I, that is what a lot of art directors and production designers will look for uh, most of all is your unique ideas and the fact that uh, you can switch between these styles. And just elaborating on that even more is that um, you end up wanting, you want to be hired for who you are, not who someone else is. Uh, you don't want to, I, I mean, this is just my point of view, right? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people will disagree. No, I mean, concept art is a lot, is, concept art's a lot like music, right? And I tell people this all the time. It's like, no matter what somebody tells you are the rules, like, you know, there's different varieties depending on who's there, when they're there. And I, I agree with you 100% on the variety and diversity. Like, if you can't show somebody creativity as a concept artist, you're dead in the water. Um, you know, they're, they're brilliant paleo artists that I work with that, man, they could just render the hell out of something in pencil, like ridiculous, right? But as far as like their creativity outside of that world, it tends to be very limited because they've spent their time in that in that world. And so, you know, there's definitely people. It's like it's like a brilliant cover band, um, you know, no matter how good. Well, I mean, I, I feel like if, if you're an artist that produces Spider-Man or Wolverine or all these other fictional characters, it's not exactly it's not like you're it's your idea. It's, it's someone else's idea. And do you really want to be known for someone who just uses other people's ideas or do you want to show that you can create the same level of work and you can create those original IPs you can you can be the person that's behind all of that and really take it to the next level right. and design all these characters from the scratch basically um, and that that's what I want to be is that person that creates those ideas it may not be what everybody else in this chat wants to do with their lives. If you want to be no, an illustrator, if you want, we'll, if you're like, you want to design Marvel characters and want to illustrate those characters, I, that is something that you should do. But yeah. it's not exactly what I 
am known for what I do. So that's, I just want to speak from my experience, you know? Yeah. Well, let's stay here for one second too. And we'll, we'll yeah, hit yeah. the questions in chat at the end, but staying yeah, here for one second on the sense of, you know, one of the artists that I've, I've used throughout my career a lot um, or referred a lot is, is Paul Richards. Um, Jay Hawkins from Epic turned me on to Paul's work way back. This is maybe 2002, 2003. And he's like, you, you know, he goes, Hey, for one of your next projects, man, you've got to use this guy, Paul Richards, check out his stuff. Like it's brilliant. It's amazing. And I went to a site at first and at first it was just like a lot of demon chicks with big boobs and it was all really, really w well done. But I'm just like, well, these are kind of demon chicks with big boobs. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, check out the helmets he did. And so I went and checked out some of the stuff he did for a first person shooter game. And there's like 60 helmets there. Right. Yeah. And and I'm just like, man, this is damn good. Like there, it's all the same helmet, but there's 60 variations on it that are all completely unique. And Jay's like, yeah, dude, he did those in like an hour. And I was <laughs> like, fuck. Right. Like I'm like, yeah, I can believe I it. Like, He's amazing. Yeah. I was like, and back then, you know, that was a big eye opener for me because I'm like, I can find 20 guys that can render the hell out of something. They could do blue sky that they, they can do great concept illustration. But when it comes to guys that have ideas, like those guys are hard to find. Somebody that could do 60 variations on a helmet design, like as good as the people I know now are, there's probably a handful that, that can pull that off fairly successfully. And you know, the question nowadays, and I think we're getting past this now, but uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not in production enough. I'm, I'm, you know, help put together art departments, but I'm not in production enough to have the best recommendation of the pulse of the industry on this. But for a good three to five years at least two years ago, he shot and rendering were just taking over everything. Everything looking photo real, everything kind of, even if it's a weaker design, if it has poor anatomy. Um, and, and, you know, I think there was a period of time before that, you know, 10 years prior in clay, where if you bought a creature bust, bust in in clay, even if it's a weaker design, it's going to annihilate a Photoshop rendering, no matter what, because a director can walk around that and you can touch it and you can see it from just kind of like VR, like we're talking about, right? And then it became, well, now when producers or, you know, art directors that are not artists look, or, or excuse me, directors that are not artists or don't have an art background, when they look at something that's rendered in key shot, that's going to have a hard time holding up against a marker sketch or, or a photo reel. Have we got past the key shot photo realism and moving into VR? Are we completely past that? Yes. Or are we still transitioning? What's your opinion on the looseness factor of being able to get away with just quick concepts and ideas no, I think, over I think illustration? I think it all works. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's restricted to a medium. I think good design will be a good design. Like if you can do a, a marker sketch and it's really clean and beautiful and it solves the problem and you compare that to like a key shot render or, or a VR model that just doesn't do that, then you right. know, the guy who does a marker sketch, you know, every time. Um, I think it, it's more, I think what it boils down to is more how you think than what you use to design. If, if, if the tools are something that can take an idea that you have in your head and help you express it better, then that's something I think is very valuable. But if you can't, if you're, if you're someone that doesn't think like that to begin with, it might not be something that will help out much. You know, it's, it's like people right. asking the classic question, you know, what's, what brushes you use? And yeah. it's yeah. as if like that will make you a great artist. Um, I always, I'm always saying it's, it's, it's how you think, it's how you process the problem and how you solve it. That's what's going to matter in the end. If, if you're someone that can only do it with pen and pen and paper, it might limit your options because of the industry pipeline. But you know, you don't really have to know that much. I know a lot of artists who, who just get by with some 3D. You have to know some 3D, but if you can, then that, that's really all you need to do if, you, if you're looking just to get by with your ideas. Um, all right, yeah, great, great. Right. Yeah, great stuff. And so, um, you know, what what's next for you? You're heading over to London to live for a year. So travel, and you know, you've moved around quite a bit here in the past few years. What impact does travel have on you know you as an artist? How do you feel like it's changed you? You've done a little bit of traveling to India and some places like that. Um, any outside hobbies? Anything else that you think would be important yeah, to pass on um, someone? Yeah, I, I know uh, some of the people here were just at a, at a talk I recently gave. Uh, so I'm sorry, this is going to be like total repeat for you guys. Uh, but uh, I definitely think traveling is important to being an artist, especially for uh, for people who are more interested in the cultural side of things. Um, I, I think, honestly, just getting any experience is important being an artist because, and I mean experience outside of your house, outside of, outside right. of your normal comfort zone. Away from the desk. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, you... 
you want everything that you design and draw is made up from your your past experiences. And if you have nothing interesting in those past experiences, it's going to be hard for you to create something that's unique. Uh, I think the more you travel, the more other things, the more incredible things you observe in in life uh, through, uh, you know, other uh, countries or maybe you go to different destinations every week. The more the more different things you observe, the more you learn about the world and the, the more interesting your art is in the end. Um, so I definitely think traveling is, is a is a huge inspiration for me. And that's one of the this definitely the reason I'm going on this trip is that I just want to, you know, separate myself a little bit from the work that I've been doing and uh, just start to, to learn more about the world again and to travel to some really interesting, unique places uh, and I'm trying to incorporate all of that into my art. Yeah, I think when our conversation, one of the things that we talked about was that if you're unable to escape your desk, if you don't have hobbies, you don't have outside life experience, whether that be travel, whatever those experiences are, you become a lot like the comedian who's doing skits on his hotel and traveling or the musician who's singing about the things that are going wrong in his life, right? Um, yeah. You start to lose depth. Um, you, you know, traveling deepens that design IQ and enables you to be somebody that can bring something to the table I haven't experienced. And, and I do think, you know, it is a little bit of a club in the sense that you want to hire people that are going to help you grow, not just as an artist, but push you in life, period. And, you know, hiring people that are doing interesting things in their life is a good way to live vicariously and get ideas of your own. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it happens for sure. Um, so that's something to look at, you know, and this is important beyond the portfolio and starts to get into the realm of the interview, right? Because the portfolio yeah. buys you the ticket to the prom. But, you know, once you get in there, you, you need to have something to, you know, to contribute to who you are. Hopefully we get to see some of who you are through your portfolio. Um, I know you only have a little bit of time and I know you're willing to give us a little extra. Thanks for, for hanging out so much um, today. Um, is there anything else that, that we, we kind of missed on before we jump into critique? And before we jump into critique, we can take a look at a few questions from chat if you want and see if there's anything in there. Uh, that yeah, I, mean, I, would just, I would just say one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately to, to everybody in chat today um, is that uh, always question your surroundings and if if that is something that will push you to learn more. And if, if what you're doing right now, if that is something that's pushing you to learn more, because if it's not, and if you're not enjoying where you are, uh, then you have to change something. Um, everybody that got into art did it because they wanted a career that they enjoy, that they love. No one's going to go into art if they don't like it in the end. Um, so if you're not having fun with it for some reason, then something needs to change. And that could be maybe the studio you're at is toxic, or maybe uh, you're, you're a student in a class and the teacher isn't really working out for you. Uh, or maybe it's just like you're, you need to get away from your family for a bit. Maybe there's something in your personal life that's holding you down. Um, but just realize that we don't have that long on this earth and you should be using every moment that you can uh, and enjoying yourself and, and really learning and progressing and bettering yourself. And that's that's what I believe. Um, the the more I see that in my own life, I uh, I feel better because of it. And and the moments that I, I haven't been learning, the moments where I haven't been gaining, um, I definitely, I feel more down. Like I look at those moments that are probably the, the sad points of my life, the points where I don't feel like I have really progressed much. Um, so yeah, I just, I just recommend to everybody, sometimes you need to take a, a step back and really analyze where you are at that point uh, and maybe make some life decisions. Um, so yeah, that's just the last thing I wanted to talk about. I think that's a really good one. I mean, you know, healthy, healthy life uh, keeps your art healthy unhealthy life can have a big impact. And, you know, if you're just like a writer or any other musician or skill set, you know, sometimes those troublesome parts of your life can also create better art, meaning that you can take those experiences and figure out how to make it something healthy by pouring it into your art at that moment and, and having that experience. So um, awesome stuff, man. I really love your stuff. Um, you've been super helpful. You stand out to me, not just from your art, but as you know, from just being helpful, you've helped me um, considerably. So, you know, I want to say thanks for that. And that that's an important skill set in this industry is just, you know, finding a way um, just to be kind and be useful, real kindness, real usefulness, <laughs> not fake kindness, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, let's switch over to your screen real quick. And um, if you got time for, you know, one or two critiques or not necessarily oh, critiques. For sure. Yeah, like I don't I don't know how we want to do it. Um, I, sure. you know, I have Photoshop open. If anybody, 
Well, first I'll just go and, a and answer questions I get, Q and A, and I can probably stay for another like 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, and then if anybody wants critique on any like environments they're doing, I feel like I'll be comfortable giving crit on that. I'm not too much of a character guy, so uh, I want to be careful about that. But um, yeah, if anybody has any sure. questions. So if you that. guys, if you guys have a CG Society Ooh. gallery link or something posted, CG Society posted up. Um, unfortunately, because of other sites' requests, we are no longer hosting other sites' art portfolios. However, I do suggest strongly that you continue to post on all portfolio sites. So if you have something posted on CG Society, go ahead and link it. Otherwise, we can browse through the CG Society gallery and choose some stuff there. And if you have any questions, go ahead and ask those questions now. Yeah, um, one person asked, uh, David Ebanks, uh, any other quick points, uh, things I shouldn't be doing while trying to break into the industry? So shouldn't be doing. Um, I guess definitely be humble when you when you get to a studio. I've seen a lot of amazing artists, actually some of the best artists in the industry, not get a job because they were very egotistical. And uh, and it's, it's people that I'm sure, that you all know, I'm sure, and it's uh, it's it's a it's sad to see because they're people that you want to work with, but then uh, they're just they it's very apparent that they're not they wouldn't be fun to work with. Um, so that's one thing I'll, I'd recommend, especially for like a junior artist. If you go into a studio, make sure to really respect everybody and to uh, you know really understand that everybody there has a ton of experience um, and you know act accordingly. Um, let's see. So I will look at, I think Jonathan posted one quick. Um, I'll check it out. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Let's see. Uh, actually, Travis, do you know how I share my screen? I have to become a presenter, right? Travis? Oh, sorry, I was muted. I didn't realize no, I was muted. Uh, one I second. Need to if you could possibly make me the presenter, that'd be awesome. You got it. There you go. OK, great. Here we go. OK, cool. So everybody sees my screen now, hopefully? Jonathan. Uh, do you, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, I'm yeah, go. yeah we, we got you. You're okay, live. So uh, let me see. Oh, OK, yeah, some cool stuff. Yeah, I see you have a lot of characters. So I am going to touch on some of the environment work first. Um, Okay, sweet, sweet. Yeah, so I see that you're going for kind of a cinematic feeling in these, Jonathan. Um, and what I'd recommend, actually, I think uh, there's there's good content, but I think what could be cool is seeing these from different camera angles and being more uh, immersive with how you design. And uh, I'll just do like a quick draw over of what I think you could do with this. And, you know, there's other things like lighting and, and you know, other issues as well. But I, I think the main thing that could really help is thinking almost like a cinematographer, or like a director. And hopefully I have my tablet connected. Yes, I do. OK, great. Um, and trying to analyze uh, how really to direct the audience's eye. Because when I when I looked at this piece up here, I, I really liked the, the content. And it reminds me of the myths almost. But you have. Uh, a very straight divide in the composition in terms of the masses. Um, and it's kind of divided in half. And one of the things as uh, concept artists that we try to do is create contrast in the shape relationships. Uh, and we want to make designs that follow, you know, a good ratio of shape design, usually like a large ratio to a small ratio. Um, so how I'd redesign this shot, uh, there's a couple ways we could do it. The first way I think that would be interesting so, you know, go a little, little bit wider, maybe. And uh, we could show this car in the foreground. And maybe the doors open, right? It's going to be super messy. And then the guy is just like, oh, my God. Like, he's just like, he just got out of his car. And he's, he's just kind of, like, stunned. And we see whatever whatever this is coming from. It could be like this very dark corridor with these tentacles like pouring out. And and what this will do is it's going to create a sense of immersion because you will then feel like you're there. Uh, you'll feel like you're in the scene because right from this shot up here, 
we kind of feel like um, we're far away. Like we, we don't have any stake in the scene. We're just an observer. But a lot of times with film and w when you're designing keyframes, you want to actually make it feel like you're, you're part of the scene. Like you're maybe sitting in this guy's passenger seat and it's just like a ridiculous scene going on. Uh, another way you could look at it, uh, which is also fun, like you say you've already done the shot, um, top down shots are always pretty fun to do with scenes like this. Um, I'm going to go back. After you already show that, if there is a moment where this thing like lurches forward, maybe we're showing the, the building right here. Maybe the, the tentacles start, start actually like dragging the car and they're pulling the car away. They grabbed hold and maybe the guy's just like running away, right? And these things are like grabbing, like right close to him, right about to grab him. And that could be a fun shot to do as well. Um, so just things that will tell more of the story because I feel like, you know, if I was in my car driving on a road and I saw this, I would be freaking stunned. I'd be pretty scared. Um, so that's the first thing I would say about this one. Uh, if I'm going to other ones that are, that are kind of interesting, um, you know, I think that in terms of this shot, oh, so maybe this is from the same project, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit hard to tell in terms of the value structure uh, where things are. Here, I'm going to open this really quick. Uh, it's not even doing, it's not doing a new scene, so I'm just going to keep it here. I would say a really good thing to do is always analyze your values. So I use a black and white layer a lot of the time to tell where things are. And one of the things I would, I would consider with this image is that uh, a lot of these values group together in a way that uh, doesn't really separate them. So, you know, you have this really dark area right here where your guy in the foreground kind of blends in with the bottom of your canvas. And then these strands here, they don't really separate too much from the sky. Uh, what I would just do uh, in whatever color you have selected, I would actually make the sky brighter behind these. And also, I would um, bring a bunch of them forward in space. I'm just going to kind of block this out really quick. Um, so say this is much brighter in terms of the sky. You know, you can we can darken it afterwards. But it doesn't really, the, the seaweed isn't really separated too much. And it's also kind of on the same plane. What you want to do is actually make some that are coming towards us in perspective, maybe like twisting and turning around. And then you have the ones that are that are farther behind. Uh, and maybe there's some that even reach so far out that there's some in the foreground too. And that'll start creating a dynamic composition where uh, you're actually representing objects on different planes of depth rather than just one. Uh, that's a really great question. Can we hand that answered? Um, okay, let me. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm just going to go back really quick to the the discussion really quick, so I can answer you guys' questions. Um, sure. They're showing work that you can collaborate with uh, others help the hiring process. Yes, um, that's a huge thing. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, when I was a student, I did a lot of collaborative projects with my friends, and. Uh, I think one definitely one thing you can definitely do is doing a group project with multiple people where you're all doing concept work is great. But even better is to show, like, say you have a modeler friend or a programmer friend or a story friend, uh, yes. getting together with people and actually producing assets based off of your models and showing that you can do paintovers and uh, showing that you can work on top of 3D models or even uh, put assets into games. That is really great. So if you can do that, that's fantastic. Um, I'll answer Andy's question. Uh, what are your thoughts about spending three months to half a year on one piece? A concept artist I follow believes that assuming your idea has already worked out, continually revising that piece until it hits a level you're comfortable with is better than moving on to another idea of painting. Actually, I believe the exact opposite. Um, yeah, mileage versus endurance on that yeah, one. Yeah, because I think that in the time that you spend revising it, uh, if you had created new pieces, you would have learned something new each time. Yeah. Uh, think of it about this way. If you... Um, do the same piece over and over again, uh, you're not really absorbing new information. It's more like you're trying to improve what's already there. Uh, however, if you do, say, 30 pieces in the same time, maybe 31 hour pieces, and you make them all different subject matters, you're, you're learning like 100 times the information that you would have spent just practicing that one piece. 
And as a result, you might get a lot of works in progress that never get released. But this is actually something, the thing that you ask is something that I was wondering about as a student, maybe like three or four years ago. And I have a very distinct uh, memory of uh, an, a really great artist, Jason Shire, coming up to my gallery at an intern show at Art Center and telling me the exact same thing, that I should, instead of revising a piece based on his feedback, I should just take it and incorporate it into a new piece. And uh, that's kind of the switching point for me where I realized that would be a much better option. So I definitely recommend um, to uh, do so, many new pieces instead of just one piece for three months. Good question um, and great answer on that one. That's, you know, a lot of artists end up also just end up in a position where they're rendering a life out of things too. Like, I, I do think that that is something like, as you said, it comes with mileage. Um, you know, even with, with Dylan Cole's class, you know, we did DVDs with Dylan 10 years ago and those DVDs still hold up. So when I did a class with him, I was really curious to see how much had changed. And it was the speed and the ability to iterate within seconds on things, like just instantaneously knowing from having that. And, and a lot of it just came down to from being presented with problems that were similar in every equation of that problem hundreds of times. So yeah. they, you know, it's, it's like martial arts. You're not even thinking about it. You're just able to kind of react almost. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great answer, uh, great question. And then uh, Beans asks, uh, in addition, how long should you spend on a piece of concert art in the studio environment? That really changes a lot. That's something that will completely change depending on the studio, the tools. Uh, the longest time I have spent personally on a piece is a month but it's not because I was rendering or changing it. What well, was changing it? It's because of revisions based on a game pipeline. Um, and that is something that can change all the time. Like a level design could change. Um, the design choices from your director could change. So that's something where it's less about you being able to solve your own idea and more about being able to represent someone else's idea. And if they change uh, their uh, what they want to get out of it all the time, then you just have to follow up with it. now. The longest time I've seen someone ideate on one piece uh, was also at ILM. And um, that there, I had a friend who had been ideating on the same design for a year and a half. Uh, so that's, if you can just believe it, like that is, you, you can actually be in a situation where you're working on the same piece for over a year. And that's all having to do with the, the production pipeline. It's, it's not like his personal decision uh, it's just that the the production he was on needed to show a ton of revisions and the director wasn't satisfied and all of these different things. All right. Um, so, I mean, if you guys have any other questions, post them now. Um, if not, you know, I'll just say that uh, um, the the shortest time I've, I've worked on something in the studio would be like 15 minute sketches. So you really, you have the opportunity to design pretty much anything and any any time period from, you know, 15 minutes to, you know, a year or over a year on the same design. So you're going to encounter tons of different things. Um, and that doesn't always mean it's okay to do that as, as a student. Like I would never recommend someone spare a year on a character design as a student. Um, but it's, it's something that's fun about being a student is that you can, you can spend a very long time you know, revising if you feel like it. I just wouldn't recommend against. I would recommend against it. I'd recommend to try out as many new things as you can. Um, but yeah, guys, um, you know, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I appreciate you guys all being here. Um, oh, let me see. Uh, Shadi Sapati in his last tutorial said the opposite where it's way better to get the piece you're working right and move on to apply learned. Well, I think people will have different it's opinions on it. Well, and it's also context. I mean, you know, yeah. if not to interrupt you, but to yeah, say, no. uh, this is where hopefully what we're trying to combat is we're not pitting one person's opinion versus another person's opinion. Hopefully through doing these, we're expanding your mind to understand that both people are right, but to go deeper into what they're trying to explain to you. And I'm not going to speak for Shadi other than to say, if Shadi's breaking that down, he may say that it's better to work through a problem or work through something that you don't understand rather than to give up because there is that balance. Like one of the things as a junior artist that you need to develop the skill for is understanding when something just is not going to work, that the foundation isn't there, that the idea isn't as solidified as you think it is and you need to abandon it. 
when you just hit that dull moment where it's not working now, but you need to work through it and figure it out or where you just don't have the skills to push it further. So that's different than just saying, take something and work on it for a year, right? Because if you're working on something for a year and you're not understanding something's entirely broken, you need to figure out what the hell that is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also just want to say that it's, um, it also depends on what section of the industry you're aiming on. Because if you're, say if you're doing pre-production for film, you will never get a month to work on a piece. It's never yeah. going to happen. Uh, you'll, you'll, I mean, usually the amount of time you get to finish a whole concept and a finished concept is sometimes even half a day to a full day. So I think that depending on where you want to go, if you want to work in games, uh, there's definitely times where you'll have to work on a piece for a month. So I definitely see that point of view. Um, but I'm just saying that, uh, like know the, the area that you're aiming for and try to organize your skill set around that, uh, because you definitely don't want to be in a position where it takes you a month to finish all your images and then you have to finish something in a day uh, because it's it, it's a completely different skill set so just know where you're trying to go um, i would say in the end and that's a good topic to bring up and you know i'll send an invitation to shaddy to see if he wants to do one of these if he has time but to, to allow him to use his own words to break down what he's doing because you know this is the thing like when you hear things that don't make sense when you hear contradictions i'm not saying just absolutely ignore it choose one side or the other beat them against each other um again we're trying to expand the mind and, and to go a level deeper so if you hear those things bring those things up cast them out there We'll try to bring the people in that say it so that they can then go deeper into that meeting to make sure that you're picking up. And then your responsibility is to take the effort to listen to the whole conversation. Um, all of you guys have been coming into these things and helping us share these. Uh, we're not looking for a giant audience, but it is really cool of you to share. Um, one thing that is a big help to myself and my partners is um, some of the classes that we offer through CTMA. If you have time, if you're interested in taking a class, just take a look and compare it to some of the other stuff that's out there for you. And even if you're not interested in class, if you could take the time and just share one of the classes that you think has value through your social network, it enables us to spend the time, uh, you know, for an hour a day doing these things and two hours a day editing them. So I'd much rather spend my time there than advertising. So please make sure that you give us a hand and share that out there. Um, registration is open now for the end of summer. And we will continue to bring two to three of these a week for you guys. And I'll also be introducing some more things for you guys to collaborate and get in and have your own voice on. Um, I think in two weeks, we're going to have our first student select, which is looking for people that are not professionals, but working towards being a professional, whether you're in a class or just online posting to the gallery. Um, Feel free to upload your art to our gallery, upload it to every other gallery that's out there. I search all of them. I look through Facebook, Instagram, you name it, and I'm constantly on the hunt for artists. So I'm always looking for fresh talent and fresh people to highlight and help you along your path. Um, thank you very much, Finn. Um, you have any classes or anything coming up for yourself that you want to kind of push or promote? Um, yeah, you know, I wish. Uh, Later this year, I might be doing a mentorship online, like a program mentorship, maybe with 10 people. Um, okay. I've already had a lot of people reach out to me, but I will put the word out. Uh, if there is anything coming out, I'll definitely let you guys know. It would be kind of like an online mentorship meeting, one-on-one uh, -on -one for an hour a week. Uh, but yeah, I'll definitely let it let it out there if um, if, if there's any free spots or if, if I figure out what's happening. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate you being here. And uh, hope to talk to you soon. And thanks, Travis, very much for hosting me. All right, Finn. It's really good. great to talk to you, buddy. Have a good one. Sure.